I have with me Temi Giwa Tuboson. Temi is the founder of LifeBank, a tech enabled logistics company working to improve access to blood, oxygen, and critical medical equipment in Nigeria and Kenya. Since 2016, Temi and her team have worked tirelessly to support and improve Nigeria's healthcare delivery systems. Welcome, Temi. Thank you for having me. So you launched AirBank in 2018, two years after LifeBank came on board. Did you envisage a time like this would come when oxygen will become a most critical need for survival? To be quite honest, oxygen has always been really, really critical. Um, you know, the highest cause of child mortality in the world is something called pneumonia. And the reason why uh, children die from pneumonia is often because there's no oxygen available. Uh, so I definitely know that, you know, it's, it's often, um, you know, a, a a, a problem and we always knew that's why we invested um, in the oxygen value chain and trying to fix the oxygen value chain uh, so all of that is is very very uh, uh, clear i think that the, you know the, the thing that you know is new is how important it has become uh, it's always been important but it's now doubly important um, now we have a major pandemic you know we our cases are rising uh, exponentially I've not seen something like that before um, you know people are desperate people desperately need medical oxygen uh, it's the key therapy uh, for for helping people with COVID-19 uh, so it's absolutely essential that we get a handle on that uh, so I never imagined I never envisioned a time like this but uh, thankfully you know we prepared and we are ready to do the work uh, to help our people how have you been coping with the oxygen demands, um, knowing that before now it was quite difficult to get oxygen? Now that it's a most critical, how, how have you been, been coping with the demand? Uh, it's quite difficult uh, coping with the demand. Um, it's quite it's quite hard. Um, you know, we've had to you know pick uh, medical. We've had to go to different parts of Nigeria just to get the supply. Uh, so once you know plants in Lagos start you know drying out, you know we have to go as far as Port Harcourt, you know as far as you know just to find critical supply to bring down to Lagos for people who are desperate uh, uh, who have this COVID-19 uh, um, uh, you know who have the the, the issue. Uh, so it's it's quite it, you know it's quite difficult I would say, uh, but I think we've been able to rise to the occasion and figure out. And thankfully we are wildly spread across Nigeria, so we're able to rise to, rise to the occasion and help the people we desperately need to help. Mm, interesting. Now, so many people wonder why oxygen is a big deal because some think, oh, it's something I just, you know, pluck off, you know, um, the air and stored in a place. Can you describe what medical oxygen is and um, how it's different from the natural air that we breathe? A medical oxygen is pure. Uh, it's a high level pure oxygen. Uh, so when your body is not working appropriately, when you are, are unable to breathe, uh, when you know the, the saturation of oxygen in your blood is really low, then it's absolutely essential that you get external oxygen. Um, it's the it's actually found to be, be more beneficial to people with COVID-19 than even ventilators. Uh, if you remember in the beginning of the pandemic, all everybody could talk about was ventilator, ventilator, ventilator. Uh, but now the reality is even from the US down, you know, all globally, uh, the reality now is get oxygen into the into the lungs of people who's, who are suffering with this uh, with this virus. Uh, so I think it is is basically the way to best way to think about it is I grade the purest of oxygen and it's absolutely what is needed when you are really uh, symptomatic for COVID-19. So some medical officers have also um, stated that the reliance or over reliance on cylinders for oxygen um, was causing a, a, a shortage and um, alternative means should be considered. What other options do we have 
all over the world you have people piping oxygen you know oxygen has to be moved in cylinders right um how so sorry you know how large that cylinder is it's a it's a matter of you know institution uh so when when you're in you know in the west in in developed countries uh you you know you have piped oxygen into the hospital bed so you know you're in a hospital bed rather than a cylinder being brought to you you know oxygen comes in pipes that is attached to your bed uh so it's much easier to get oxygen to you because it's like it's automated it's seamless um and and but you need electricity you need 24 hour electricity to build that kind of system you need the right structure you need you know excellent management of hospitals you know our hospitals across nigeria still struggle with having water struggle with having electricity um struggle with having a lot of the critical things they need to serve patients so um at the moment our best bet is to build a proper cylinder system uh while we wait until we develop enough to be able to do piped oxygen into the hospital to bed of course there are machines there are machines as well uh but the problem with machines is it also requires electricity there are oxygen concentrators that you know help with this you know work that you can you know bring a machine there are usually like small small fans or small uh ACs that that act as concentrators that can uh, bring oxygen from the you know take oxygen and make it more more, more purer and then give it to the patient uh but what you need is electricity to run these machines and these machines are expensive uh if they break down it's quite hard to fix them uh so there there are of course other options but the reason why the the public health institutions uh, across Nigeria are not opted for these kind of options is because we don't have the right systems we don't have energy uh access to energy is absolutely critical for us to be able to build uh, a state of the art oxygen delivery system uh for the country mm. that's quite interesting okay so you enumerated some some challenges since the beginning of um, this pandemic can you tell me how you've been able to navigate you know all of those challenges so power um even traffic sometimes how have you been able to you know to navigate all of those you know challenges Yeah that's a very great question thank you so much um of course we are operating in Nigeria and you have to deliver on time in the right condition quickly sensitive products like oxygen and blood uh there are lots and lots of such challenges uh you know but we are experienced we've been operating in Nigeria for 5 years uh we know exactly what the challenges are uh we have our systems in place to respond to those challenges and i think it's that experience that allowed us to quickly expand the value chain for oxygen the distribution system that we've been able to build for medical oxygen is that experience that allowed us to open testing center and you know we were the first the very first now you know you have uh, testing centers from private sector all over the country and uh, all over Lagos specifically but you know we were the very first to open a mass testing center for covid-19 in Nigeria and we're very proud of our work and and what we've been able to pull off um and and to be quite honest um you know uh it is that expertise that th- i think sets us apart a live bank uh, that allows us to do this work and do it well mm. well done Hold on. Okay. Now, um so there's Life Bank and there's um um Air Bank. You also recently launched Quip. Now, tell us more about um Quip and how you've been able to work with them um, hospitals. How, what 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 has been the response to Quip? Right. So Quip was actually a product that entirely came from the pandemic. Uh you know, before the pandemic we weren't thinking in this, you know, uh, uh, environment at all. Um so what we started thinking with the pandemic is that how do we make sure that you know if, if you remember I'd, I'd mentioned earlier if you recall in the beginning of the pandemic there was a lot of focus on ventilators and respirators yeah. um and th- there was a desperation in the system to find these machines uh we knew that these machines already exist in Nigeria and we knew that many of them probably broken down in some parts of you know public hospitals so we set aside our time to find these machines find them fix them when they're broken down and make them available to people who are treating patients with covid-19 and that was what we set out to do and to be quite honest we we got a national register of this 
you know critical equipment it ended up not being uh the the key thing and medical oxygen became the key thing and we, we were able to respond uh to that and and switch and, and and pivot to medical oxygen but we had built this amazing product and we decided to make it available to the to the public uh to our hospital partners to help them fix maintain uh look after the equipment that they use in their hospital Before the pandemic and since the pandemic um, broke out, what lessons have you learned about Nigeria's preparedness, you know, for medical emergencies? I love Nigeria with all my heart. You know, I, I you know, I, I am Nigerian as they come, but I think in that love, you know, I'm also aware of uh, the things that we do well and the things we don't. Uh, to be quite honest, I think one of the things I'm trying to do with Life Bank is to help Nigeria solve the problems that it is not very well, uh, very, very confident and comfortable solving. We're not planners, you know, generally as a, as a country. We are not, we're not planners. Uh, we're not, we're, we're highly optimistic, which is really good. So we always think good things will come. So we, we for the most part, don't often plan for bad things to happen. Um, so, you know, for me, I think what we need to do, you know, the way that I see this thing is we're entering a pandemic age. Um, the world is now a global world. Global travel is so seamless. It's as seamless as it's ever been in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. It means that I can wake up today in Lagos and be in New York City tomorrow morning. Uh, it means that somebody can wake up in, you know, so it's in one, it's one world. Uh, anything can happen. Uh, you can have a virus move from a tiny, tiny village in Sierra Leone and shut down West Africa and get to the US and get to Europe and get to Asia and get to every part of the world. You can have a, a virus that in a small, small, small market in Wuhan, in China, and shut down the global economy. Uh, so this is the pandemic age and no one is exempt. Uh, Nigerians are definitely not exempt. Uh, so we must, you know, Right now we're responding to COVID-19, but I think the fear and the, and the concern that I have is that post-COVID, we're gonna forget, right? Post-COVID, sure. we're gonna back, go back to business as usual. Yeah. But in this pandemic age, it's essential, it's absolutely critical that we start preparing for the next pandemic. As soon as we're done with COVID, or even while we're working on COVID, we're preparing for the next pandemic and the next pandemic and the next pandemic, because it will come. It will surely come. Uh, the world is global. It's one world now. Travel is as easy as it can ever be, um, which means that we are all at risk of everything that happens in any corner of the world, which means that everybody must be prepared. We need to build um, you know, response infrastructure. We need to build supply chain. We need to make sure that we have, uh, if global supply chain is shut down, where are we going to get the mask? Where would we get the gloves? Uh, if we can't reach our manufacturers in, in Asia, where would we get the supplies? Uh, we need to consider things like about technology department, you know, areas, our industry, are we investing? How much are we investing in biotech? Uh, you know, we, we want to, you know, we've been able, we've been, you know, no African countries have been able to develop a COVID vaccine. Um, why? It, it isn't that we don't have the scientists, it isn't that we don't have the structure, it's that we don't have the investment. And it requires investment. It requires decades long of just putting money in biotech, biotech and then reaping the reward when there's a pandemic that and then you can develop a vaccine rapidly. It requires preparedness. It requires paying doctors, you know, the right amount that they deserve. Mm -hmm. It requires ensuring that our, our you know, uh, public health institutions work, our primary health centers work, our secondary health centers work, our tertiary institutions have the right uh, tools that they need to do high level uh, research. Uh, so for me, I think those are the critical things that we need to figure out. And my fear is that we will not do it and we'll wait till the next pandemic to start having this conversation again. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you and I share um, same fears. but. In five years, and um, especially now, I'm sure you must have worked closely with um, government officials. When you um, have the chance to sit or speak to some of those, you know, those people in government, 
what are the challenges they, they share as to how they cannot fix all of those challenges you know you you enumerated uh, is it is it a lack of will or like you said we are just optimistic and just you know fold our hands and think oh it will never happen to us what are the, what are the, what are the feelers you get from from government officials you know the reality is healthcare is never on the ballot for us in nigeria mm. right there's no politician who is selected because they have an excellent plan for our health system right healthcare is not is never on the ballot for the nigerian people we are not having you know demonstrations we are not having we are not suing because we don't have the right healthcare sector so to be quite honest there's no incentive for people in government to invest in healthcare right uh, they will be you know they'll be better off you know investing in buildings instead of the structure inside the health center that will allow the health center to work uh, that's the reality now. Healthcare is not on the ballot, uh, and there are no consequences for poor healthcare in Nigeria at the moment. Um, so until the Nigerian people decide that healthcare is absolutely important, and that we will do everything in our power to ensure our governments respond, politicians will not respond. Uh, politicians will not care. Um, you know, all of my, you know, every, you know, uh, contacts that I've had in the healthcare sector. Um, usually it's with healthcare people, people who care about the sector, people who are passionate. I don't think there's a commissioner for health all over Nigeria who is not critically passionate about fixing this sector. Because by the time you work in healthcare, you're passionate, you believe, you're a deep believer in the sector. But you know, if your principles don't care about the sector and if you know your population don't don't are not, you know, you know, agitating for 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 a change in your in the health sector, then no one is gonna listen to you until there's a pandemic. And then as soon as the pandemic seems to be over, people will stop listening to you again. Uh, so it's 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 a problem for me um, because when you go to the US, healthcare is on the ballot. When you go to the UK, you know the NHS is 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 always on the ballot. Um, but for us in this part of the world, it is not, and and it's actually quite a concerning thing. And I think it must change. Mm. Quite interesting. Okay, now let me put you on the spot. So let's say um, Tim is called upon today. Um, to take charge of the health ministry of Nigeria. What are the critical things? <laughs> what are the, especially, especially um, um, considering the fact that you mentioned that we are, we are going to be facing loads and loads of pandemic in future. So what are the critical steps you will take? Let's say Tim is appointed today as um, the health minister of Nigeria. <laughs> First of all, that would never happen. <laughs> don't, don't be too, um, don't be too but, sure. But I'm very sure. I'm very sure. Um, but let's say we're in Neverland. Um, so what, 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 you know, what would Temi do? To be quite honest, I would invest in a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I'm very public and, and clear on on what I on my on my own, and this is personal. You know, it's personally uh, Tammy's opinion. I need to make that clear. And and for me, I think it is. You know, there needs to be a separation of roles and responsibilities. I think that it is really critical that public sector does what public sector does well and pri private sector should do what private sector do well. Um, I think when you think about a health system, you, the first thing is payments. Who is going to pay for what? Because if you deliver a baby today, it's expensive to deliver a baby. Uh, you know, I can roll out everything for you. You know, one bag of blood, you know, in, 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 in the world is quite expensive uh, because these are expensive, you know, things and these are expensive therapies. Uh, so for me, I think the first thing is who's going to pay? Um, I think for me, if I'm put in charge of our health system, the first thing I will build is a pool, is a required pool for everybody to contribute to healthcare uh, in Nigeria. I will require people who have income to contribute some part of their income into healthcare. That would be my first decision. Because without this pool, we really cannot invest in healthcare. We really cannot ensure that our healthcare sector works. And the only person that can do that is the, the government. Uh, because the government is the only uh, 
um, you know, uh, authority that can author that can require that you contribute to your own healthcare. Uh, no one else can. Um, and second, I will, you know, seed, you know, the delivery of the healthcare to the private sector. I think it's needed. I think, you know, we know that private sector can operate these hospitals and they can ensure the hospitals will work. So I will seed that part to the private sector. And thirdly, creates a very strong regulatory oversight system sure that service has been delivered well for me i think those those would be the first three things that i do compel our people to, com to contribute to their health care and if people are unable if people have no income contribute to the health care on their behalf so that we have a pool where whether you're sick or you're not you have a pool that you can tap into to make sure that you get the healthcare service that you need. Second, seed healthcare delivery to the private sector. And third, create a strong regulatory oversight function for the ministries of health to ensure that healthcare delivery is excellent. Thanks for those um, three points. What is your message for Nigerians who still take this, you know, this situation with levity, who don't care, who don't believe that? COVID-19 is real, what is your message to them? COVID is real and it is dangerous and it is vicious and it will kill you. COVID is real. It is a terrible enemy. It, COVID is relentless in its need to destroy your body. COVID is real. Do not listen to anyone who says it's not. COVID is real and it kills. So wear your mask. Wear your mask at all times wear it over your nose at all times and know that there is no institution that's going to rescue you mm. when if and if you get COVID, you will be on your own because there is a fatigue out there on helping people because there was a lot of help in the beginning of the pandemic so COVID is real it is out there you're going to be alone if you get this virus so the best thing you can do for yourself is, and it's actually quite an expensive disease. It is expensive to need oxygen day in, day out for more than six days. One cylinder of oxygen is 6,000. A COVID-19 patient could use 20 of that in a day, right? If you don't have this kind of money day in, day out, wear your mask. The consequences of you know, the let's say you COVID is not real. You know, let's let's even let's take that that COVID is not real, right? Wearing your mask is not going to hurt you. No. <laughs> There's no consequences to wearing your mask. But if COVID is real, the consequences of COVID is death. For me, I think it's a great bargain. Just wear the mask. It's not gonna hurt you. And if you get COVID, it's gonna kill you. So wear the mask. Do you understand? You know, it, it is it is really, 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 it's the simplest, most efficient way of stopping a, a vicious pandemic in stride. And it is really, really critical that everybody understands it. It's very simple. Wear your mask. You know, just wear it, cover your nose, cover your mouth, mouth. And it's the only way to keep yourself safe in this horrible pandemic. Thank, thank you so much for that message. Um, one last question, even I said um, that was my last question. I wanted to find out, okay, so I know all of this uh, your interventions, it's been um, quite challenging in terms of um, um, human efforts, human resources. So in terms of even funding too, how have you been able to manage, you know, where, where are you getting funding from, where are you getting support from? We cannot uh, help people unless there are funders to help us help. Uh, and we believe in that model. We think that there's always, you know, public, you know, institutions, either private or public, who are willing to help people uh, when there is a major pandemic. So every work we've done is through partners who trusted us. And we really made a decision to focus on private sector partners, banks, and you know institutions and companies and pharmaceutical companies etc that have partnered with us even a fintech company that partnered with us to get us to get oxygen across nigeria uh, the company is called dan Odin's foundation uh, so for us what we've been able to do is inspire private sector companies with our capacity to operate 
you know get them to fund uh, these therapies, these projects, and then deliver these things to the people who desperately need it most. That is our model. We believe deeply that testing during a pandemic must be a public utility. It must be available to people no matter what their income, which is why we made it absolutely free of charge by partnering with, with companies who will make it happen for us. We really, really deliberately focus on private companies for, for partnership because of course whenever you you know you know how this thing goes partnering with public institutions is often hard uh, so we really we partnered with public institutions on delivering the service but in terms of funding uh we focus on partnership with private sector that's how we've been able to pull it off very interesting okay thank you so much Temi. i've been chatting with um Temi gilwato boson Temi is the founder of life bank um a tech enabled logistics company working to improve access to blood oxygen and critical medical equipment in Nigeria and Kenya. Thank you so much for your time, Temi. It's so really nice having you. Thank you for having me. Have a very lovely afternoon. You too. Take care of yourself and stay safe.